Mr. Talbot, Martin, Joe, Richard, thank you for inviting me to talk to you this morning. Uh, my task is to talk to you about Singapore's foreign policy. Uh, I hope you do not conclude that it was an act of reckless folly to invite me to talk to you this morning. And to minimize that risk, I am going to be very brief. Um, Singapore is a very unnatural place. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was once on record as saying, small island city-states are a political joke. And as Heng Chi told you, he did not believe that Singapore could be independent. So we had independence trust upon us and had to make the best of it. The essence of Singapore's foreign policy can be summed up in the first premise from which we start, devising policy, that small states are intrinsically irrelevant in the world. Relevance for a small state is an artifact to be created by human endeavor, and having been created, has to be maintained by human endeavor. And that is the basic strategic imperative of Singapore's foreign policy, to create relevance. How do you do it? There is no magic formula. There is no master plan. There cannot be, because what makes you relevant today vis-a-vis -vis country A may be quite irrelevant vis-a-vis -vis country B, and what makes you what was relevant today may be irrelevant in a week or a month or a year. In, in short, it is a process of constant adaptation. All foreign policy for countries big and small is a constant process of adaptation for the very simple reason is that the world cannot be predicted. You will always be ambushed by events, and you have to develop the capability to respond to them quickly. But there are some basic principles, I think. Heng Chi spoke about the governance model. You cannot be relevant if you are a failed state. You cannot be relevant if you are just an ordinary country, if you are small. Some of my colleagues, Kishore, <laughs> uh, for example, are fond of talking about Singapore as a think tank state coming up with new ideas. That's true, we try. But I think Mr. Lee would not disagree if I say that the most brilliant idea of a small country can be ignored if inconvenient, whereas the stupidest idea of a large country has to be taken seriously because of the damage stupid ideas of large countries can do. <laughs> and we've seen some evidence of this recently in the Middle East, for example. <laughs> Uh, you have, Heng Chi talked about being extraordinary. A small country cannot just be an ordinary success. Because if you were just like your neighbors, why would anybody want to deal with you rather than larger, better endowed countries? You have to be extraordinary. But we are not just a small country anywhere. We are a small country in Southeast Asia. And that environment prescribes certain constraints and certain imperatives for your foreign policy. Singapore was expelled from Malaysia for a very simple reason. Because we organize ourselves on the basis of multiracial meritocracy, whereas our neighbors organize themselves on rather different principles, the political dominance of one race or one religion. And that tension between two different models of governance uh, is the existential problem of Singapore. Because if you are extraordinary, your very existence is taken as a criticism of alternative uh, systems. Now, if we were a failure, everybody would pat us on the head and say, oh, poor thing, you know, you're right. Uh, but if you are successful, as we must be, then you are not necessarily popular. Uh, foreign policy is not about being popular. I learned this from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as a very young diplomat. It is about getting your way, preferably by being nice, but if necessary, by any means necessary. That is the be-all and end-all of Singapore's foreign policy. Of course, the specifics are subject to the, you know, myriad variety of life, the constant adaptation, 
and the environment for us is getting more and more difficult. Singapore became independent in 1965. The most salient international fact in 1965 was the Cold War. The Cold War was an extremely dangerous period, but it had one virtue, that of clarity. You know where you were. You are here or you are there. Even if you pretended to be on the line, you had to take your alignment from the, the Cold War division. We are now in a much more complicated in, international environment where these simple certainties have dissolved. They will not be recreated. It is becoming much more difficult for a small country like Singapore to pick the means of creating relevance in a very ambiguous environment. It's not unique to Singapore, but for a small country, it is uniquely... Um, the, the, the dilemma is uniquely focused because small countries do not have margins for, for error. Small countries are constantly maneuvering to position themselves to create relevance, to get out of harm's way or to seize the opportunity that may be thrown out by events. It's much more difficult now. Secondly, I think our domestic environment uh, is much more complex. When I joined the Foreign Service about 34 years ago, uh, we were very fortunate because nobody was interested in foreign policy. So more or less you had a free hand, the government. Uh, I'm afraid that that is passing, but the greater interest in foreign policy is not matched by a greater awareness of the limits of what a small state can or cannot do. My younger colleagues, some of them sitting there, all know a Singapore that is prosperous. This is not the natural state of affairs. Singapore is a very unnatural place, completely uh, an artificial creation. I am afraid that the, foreign, the emerging foreign policy debate in Singapore is one that is completely ignorant of some of the realities of foreign policy in Singapore. At this conference that resulted in the book, I was asked a question by a PhD candidate, uh, a, a young Singapore woman writing her PhD uh, in international relations. I must admit that the question quite flummoxed me, uh, and it confirmed all my prejudices about the academic study of international relations. Uh, she asked me, why can't Singapore have a foreign policy like Denmark or Switzerland? And the obvious answer is because we are not Denmark or Switzerland. We are live in Southeast Asia, not Northern Europe. But that uh, a PhD candidate, uh, I think she's quite an intelligent person, despite doing a PhD, <laughs> uh, could ask such a question in seriousness, worried me a lot. <laughs> And I think this is the key issue about Singapore's future. Do our younger generation, does, does our younger generation take that the prosperity they see around them for granted? Do they understand that it is utterly man-made, artificial? Or do they take it as the natural order of things? If it is a latter, then I'm afraid we are, uh, we are going to go the way of all city-states. Um, throughout history. Let me end with one simple point, to reinforce the point that small countries are irrelevant and you cannot take your relevance for granted. Now, modern Singapore was founded as a trading center, uh, a hub for trade, a hub for logistics, a hub for finance for trade. And we have performed those functions as part as a British colony, uh, as part of Malaysia, and as an independent and sovereign country. The point being that sovereignty and independence is not a necessary condition for you to, to perform these functions. You could well perform these functions, and we have, as part of another country, uh, under the thumb of another country, and it is not, therefore, to be taken for granted. Uh, so I leave you with that thought. We have been around for 50 years. I hope 
we are going to be around for at least another 50 years, if not 150 years, but it is not something I take for granted. Thank you.